Hi, I'm Wesley, and today we're going to be going over Wilson's general model of information behavior. The way that this presentation is going to go is I'm going to show the timeline of the development of the model, the impact that the model has had, uh, go over the original model and criticisms related to it, the amended model and criticisms and benefits related to it, and some of the primary themes that arise in Wilson's work. So Wilson has been continually developing multiple models related to information behavior, and it can get a little confusing if you aren't familiar with them already. In 1981, Wilson published the original general model of information behavior in the paper on user studies and information needs. And also in that paper, he published the model of information seeking behavior, which is different. In 1996, he expanded and updated the general model of information behavior and inconveniently, for our purposes, did not rename it. <laughs> and in 1999, three additional models have been added to Wilson's <laughs> portfolio, including the nested model of information behavior, which we have already seen in the class. This, again, is a different model, and we're just going to be focusing on the general model of information behavior. And in 2016, Wilson uh, combined his models and works into a general theory of information behavior, which again, we're not going to be focusing on. So the impact of this model um, is really, it was, it was valuable for advancing the field of information behavior as opposed to information seeking. And what's unique about it is that it doesn't require a definition of what information actually is because it's coming from a person-centered approach rather than an information-centered approach. Um, so the concepts of information behavior and information need as opposed to information seeking or what information is really marked a big transition in the field of information science. Um, also, especially in the later model, uh, the inclusion of context and the needs of people very intentionally and qualitative research was a very new thing and obviously has had a great impact as we know from our context week. So the this is the original model and we're just going to go over how, how it works. Um, at the top of the model here we have the information user and the user has a particular information need. The need is what drives the user to perform information seeking behavior by putting demands on information systems, which would be like a library catalog, um, or other information sources, which is pretty much anything that's not specifically designed for information retrieval. Um, we then have either the success of the demand, like the demand has been fulfilled, or the failure of the demand, um, and uh, if the demand is successful, then they now have information that they can use. Um, if that information has satisfied their need, then they can start the process again with a new need. If it has not satisfied the need, then they can start the process again with the same need that they had before. Um, and information use can also lead to additional information seeking behavior especially information exchange. And the information exchange over here is really about uh, rather than seeking information from sources or systems, it's about trading or sharing information or, or asking for information from other people. And again, once they have the information they can use, then they may be able to provide that information through information transfer to others. One question that we might want to ask ourselves is what the real difference is between pursuing uh, information exchange via other people and putting a demand on another information source, like wouldn't asking other people for information essentially be putting a demand on another information source. I think that uh, it was sort of intentionally separated like this as a way of highlighting um, communication with other people, but I don't think it's strictly necessary. Um, so the primary parts of this model, just the, the main takeaway is that the uh, information user has a need and they demand information from somewhere to satisfy that need. 
Here's just a bigger uh, close up in case you need it. The um, criticisms of this model, uh, one from Robson and Robinson is that the sequence is too linear and idealized, that it's not, that information seeking behavior isn't strictly like you have a need, you perform the behavior, you do the demand, there's success or failure, and then you go back. Um, but it can be a lot more fluid and less um, idealized. And another criticism is one that Wilson acknowledges himself, which is that it doesn't offer any hypotheses or causative factors. Um, for example, what it is about having an information need that causes some certain information behavior over another, which means that nothing in this model is directly testable. And instead it acts more as a map for um, guiding research uh, in a very broad way, which is part of what led to this updated model. Um, this updated model, uh, again, has the person as the centered, um, part of the of the model like it's it's a person-centered approach um and it, it this time they have been dubbed person in context as opposed to information user um to more intentionally incorporate context into the model um so the context of information need then is the situation in which they need information um this informs the activating mechanism which is essentially the thing that causes the user to start trying to fulfill that need. Um, Wilson attempts to address the issue of a lack of causative factors in his first model by attaching uh, these theories to the activating mechanism. The stress slash coping theory was proposed by psychologist Susan Folkman, and it informs the activating mechanism by explaining why some needs will activate a search for information and others won't. Um, of course, one could still use this model, even if they disagreed with stress or coping theory, by uh, replacing it with another one and considering how another theory would act as uh, the activating mechanism or would inform the activating mechanism. Um, so we can think of this first activ activating mechanism as being context independent in a way, because it uh, only depends on the context of the information need, and we haven't yet incorporated the person's context yet. Um, so now that the person has had their information need activated, and uh, the situation context has been accounted for, um, we then face the intervening variables, which are essentially the elements of context that affect the person's information behavior either positively or negatively. Uh, so here Wilson categorizes them into psychological, demographic, role-related or interpersonal, environmental and source characteristics, but you could basically um, organize these however you like, depending on how you prefer to account for all aspects of context. Um, that is what, you know, now that we've accounted for the person's context as well as the situational context, that is when we have the second activating mechanism, which is the thing that actually pushes the person toward their information seeking behavior. Um, here, Wilson attributes the second mechanism as being informed by risk slash reward theory, uh, which is from the field of economics, itself affected by social learning theory, which includes the concept of self-efficacy, <laughs> um, which is basically whether the person believes they will be able to successfully execute the search. Again, these theories may be swapped out or adjusted depending on your views. Um, the most important thing to consider is how the activating mechanisms are affected and how they may be explained. The information seeking behavior has now been adjusted to move away from demands being placed on systems and more towards incorporating different types of searching, both intentional searching like active search and unintentional like passive search. Um, and the interaction with other people has been absorbed by other parts of the model. So information transfer would now probably fit in with information processing and use, for example. Either way, information processing and use is the, the outcome of the information seeking behavior and then starts all over again.
again, here's a nice <laughs> big one if you need to take a screenshot or anything. So some criticisms of this uh, updated model. One is from Godbold in 2006, which is that uh, Durbin's concept of the information gap is not accounted for because it doesn't exactly fit in as an intervening variable. The idea of the information gap is that uh, P, it's sort of about the perceived distance between oneself and the information that they seek and how that will affect them performing information behavior. One could say that it is, you know, sort of incorporated in the risk reward theory self efficacy thing, which is why I went over it. Um, but Godbold, Godbold has a, a version of the model that more intentionally accounts for it. Um, and another criticism, uh, a criticism of mine, is that the activating me mechanisms as a concept seem very artificial. Um, and I don't know that there is always a single moment that you can um, point to, and certainly not two moments that are distinct enough from each other that you can point to and say, well, this is the point at which they start performing information seeking behavior. Um, it's, uh, it, it just seems a little artificial and I, I would be interested to go into what the activating mechanism is meant to do a little more. Um, some of the benefits of this uh, model though, and some of the very interesting parts are that it organizes concept context in relationship to information behavior and not as some outside component. So it talks about how context will ultimately lead up to the information seeking behavior and, and how it affects um, information seeking behavior in a very intentional way as opposed to just having some outside thing that says, oh yeah, the context is over here, but we're really focusing on the information behavior. Um, so having a very integrated model is very interesting. Um, it also is, is interesting how it centers around the moments leading up to the information seeking and use rather than the seeking itself. And that's something that I uh, wouldn't have necessarily considered. I would, I would tend to consider that, well, when a person has decided to seek, then that is the part that we are interested in. Um, so I think that this has done a really good job of guiding, uh, our attention, I suppose, away from information seeking and towards general information behavior. Some of the primary themes in Wilson's work and that have definitely um, influenced the construction of this model are that uh, Wilson focuses a lot on interdisciplinarity um, or you know, designing the model specifically in a way that makes them applicable to all fields and not just library and information science. Um, as we saw when creating the revised model, Wilson drew on theories from experts in uh, fields outside of information science. Um, one helpful explanation of what interdisciplinarity means and a model for how we can evaluate something's interdisciplinarity <laughs> appears in this journal article if you uh, ever want to learn more about that. Um, and another theme that I really appreciate in Wilson's work is that barriers to information access include social inequality and that social inequality affects not only the way that people um, search for information or, the, or people's information behavior, but also the way we study it. Um, for example, many research studies are done in academic settings, which is already an unequal and non-representative slice of humanity. Uh, so Wilson encourages us to be self-reflexive um, when we are researching and to account for barriers to information behavior and information access that we may be unaware of at the time or in the context of our uh, research study. And I just, I really appreciate um, how he does that very intentionally. So I have a few discussion questions for, uh, you know, interacting with Wilson's general model. Uh, one question is why does Wilson include two separate activating mechanisms and what would be an intuitive example of each kind of activating mechanism? Or if you don't think that 
there should be two, then what is an intuitive example of a single activating mechanism? Uh, is context an intervening variable? Um, what is the difference between the context of the information need and an intervening variable? So I mentioned that here. We have the context of information need over here, which I interpret to be sort of the situational context, and then we have intervening variables, which are supposed to be the context of the person. So why do we have those separate, and can they be separated? Uh, and of course, do you have a different view of what the, what those are supposed to mean? And then, is there a different theory from any field uh, that could have a causal effect at any point in the model? We know that Wilson is concerned about the causal effects of, um, you know, theories that will affect the the model, and so we, here he's incorporated stress slash coping theory as part of the activating mechanism and risk and reward theory. Are there any other theories that you maybe would want to incorporate or replace these with, or other theories that would affect this model um, in any way uh, from any field, not just information science? Um, yeah, so thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've come away from this with a clearer understanding of how to read the primary steps of Wilson's model, um, how the model has changed over time, and a few of the themes that have influenced Wilson's work. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to having our discussion. Bye!